In order to get some sense of what philosophers do, whether we're talking about contemporary philosophers, those teaching philosophy, explaining it, commenting on it, or the many philosophers that comprise the vast history and the interlocking conversations that we assemble under that name, it might be helpful to spend a little bit of time talking and thinking about some of the common elements of philosophical work. Some of the things that you see across not just philosophical schools, but even time, space, cultures, because all of these are going to show up more or less in work that we consider philosophy and in current contemporary philosophizing. So this is not an absolutely comprehensive list. We're not attempting to uh, detail the entire philosophical toolbox as if we were a hardware store with aisles going down them and looking at every single possible instrument that we might use, but it's just to give you a sense of some of the big things that we, we often do bring up. And I've brought some of these together under some headings where I think there's at least some, some commonalities or connections. So the first one to start talking about is doctrines, theses, principles. We might also talk about judgments or you know, dogmas, there's, there's a lot of different terminology that gets used for this. Generally, these are going to be propositions that sometimes actually get laid out in something like a manifesto or a listing. And, you know, philosophy is, to a significant extent, um, the articulation of doctrines, the things that are being taught, the things that are being expressed as... You know, representations of how things actually are according to a particular philosopher or school. Or we might also present somebody else's doctrines in order to say, well, they're getting things wrong, but here's what they think. Theses is, is a similar way. A thesis is something that is set down or set forward. I believe that freedom is important and we need to understand it better so that we can afford everybody at least the opportunity for freedom. Well, that's that's a thesis that could also be understood as a doctrine. It could also be understood as a principle. A principle usually when we're talking about philosophy is identified as something that you're going to use at the start and argue from or develop from some other ideas, some other theses and doctrines. Um, and these can be kind of interchangeable with each other. There is a sense of greater priority to principles, but one person's principle might be another person's spurious doctrine and, and vice versa. So that's an important part, being able to say, well, what does Aristotle actually have to say? What does Aristotle clearly think about this? That might be expressed in, in terms of those. And very often philosophers will clarify this for us. In some modes of philosophizing, they're very bent on being super clear about this. In others, we have to work for it a good bit more. And sometimes um, ideas get framed and attributed to philosophers that they don't actually say, but interpreters will read in, like, you know, the thesis of the uh, uh, unity of the virtues, right? Aristotle doesn't actually use that term, but people talk about that. Sometimes they'll say the doctrine or the argument, right? Uh, that takes us to another thing. So let, let's talk now about the next one, definitions and essences. So the essence of something, if, if something does have an essence, would be what makes it what it is. And a definition is an attempt to in some way express or articulate the, the essence of something. And these very often are things we have to work towards rather than immediately beginning with knowing evidently or going to a dictionary. Philosophy consists in a significant extent in working with these and trying to uh, make sense of them. It's important too to recognize that the same term 
may not have the same meaning moving from one philosopher to another or from another one philosophical school to another. All of these slippery terms that have, we, we call them ambiguous or polysemous, they have different ranges of meaning. We have to be careful with them. Some of these are very important philosophical terms or concepts like substance. What, what is it to be a substance? Ask Aristotle, get one answer. Ask Nietzsche, get another answer. Ask uh, the Stoics, get another answer. We, we could go on and on. But they, they will have something in common. It's not totally arbitrary, but we do have to spend some time working on that. And, and that's, that's an important tool of philosophy. Once we have things that are good working definitions, we can go forward from there. We can use them in a kind of deductive way. We can say, well, that... That implies this, or this case over here seems to fit the definition. This case over here doesn't. Analogies and examples. This is actually one of my favorite parts of the discipline of philosophy. When we make analogies, we're saying that there's some sort of similarity or derivation relation between things. So, you know, Aristotle will, will actually talk about Analogia, as will other philosophers, like, for example, Seneca. Um, here's a prime example. Seneca uses the word analogy to describe how we get our conception of these great character traits that are the virtues. We don't begin with definitions and essences. We see people doing extraordinary things, displaying traits of character, and we're like, wow, that's courage. I'm, I'm actually seeing it. And then we analogize from that to, well, what would that be like in our own life? We, you know, battlefield courage, not every one of us has to be on the battlefield, but maybe we do have to stand up to bullies, or we do have to give a speech, or we do have to say something to a friend that's quite difficult for us to say because we're afraid of the consequences. Well, good, that's, that's an analogy, right? And analogies cover a vast field. Examples are very, very important. I, I tend to think that this is, if, for a practitioner of philosophy who's teaching, being able to come up with good examples and then lead students through them and see the weak points, you know, where the example breaks down or the analogy breaks down and the similarities, that's a really important skill. And in saying that, I am echoing the many people who called attention to Anselm of Canterbury and his extraordinary ability to do this on the spot. So that's, that's often less a matter of pure intellect and much more a matter of imagination as, and you know, being able to reach an audience. But analogies and examples really do help us conceptualize these more abstract things that we're working with in philosophy. They root us to the, the ground that we're working on. Hypothetical inferences and thought experiments. Somewhat connected with the idea of examples, a thought experiment is a little bit more well worked out. We say, imagine to yourself an island in which this is the case. And then we say, well, what would be the consequences of that? Or how would, how would the world be different? Or how would you deal with this sort of situation? Another classic thought experiment, the trolley problem, right? A trolley is going out of control down the tracks and it will run over five people who are tied to the tracks unless you flip a switch, which diverts it so it kills only one person. What do you do? Well, that's a thought thought experiment, right? And there's a variety of those. And we can think of thought exper experiments as being kind of like an analogies and examples, but also like being hypothetical inferences where you say, let's assume X is the case. What follows from that? Now with hypothetical inferences, we might be doing that because we say, we don't actually have direct knowledge of this, but let's imagine this is the case. What would follow from this? I mean, you could actually take Kant's first critique as involving a lot of that, right? If this is going to be the case, which we call this transcendental critique, uh, then what has to also be the case? We could do this when we want to refute an opponent's position or weaken their position. We say, well, you're saying this, but if we assume that this is the case, then your doctrine is going to lead to something false or something bad or something we don't want to arrive at. And so hypothetical inferences can serve all sorts of purposes, but we do a lot of this. 
again, to bring up Immanuel Kant, uh, if you think about the categorical imperative, its first formulation, we ask, well, what would it be like if everybody did this action that I'm proposing to do? And students will often get hung up on this and they say, yeah, but everybody doesn't do that. And we say, that's, that's completely correct. But what would it be like? What would follow from that, right? And being able to do this is also, like with analogies and examples, a matter not just of intellect, but also of imagination, and perhaps even empathy or compassion, depending on what sort of inferences and experiments we're working with. Another really key aspect of philosophy, and this is one in which my practical work as a professional philosopher outside of academia has shown to me just how characteristic this is of philosophy and how important it is, is being able to make distinctions and then show what follows from the distinction. Sometimes this can be as simple as sitting at a table with two people that are talking about some sort of process in their workplace, and both of them are arguing with each other and saying, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong. And then you say, listen, you're both using this same term, but you're using it in this way, and you're using it in this way. You're using it with two different senses. Let's make a distinction here. You're partly right, you're partly right. And they're like, it's magic. No, it's not magic. It's just the operation of making distinctions, which is partly an operation of the intellect, being able to slice things down and could be a you know, distinction, two things. It could be you know, distinction between three things. It could be a whole bunch of distinctions. Sometimes we can say, you're talking on this level, you're talking on this higher meta level about the same thing. So it's really very important. A prime example of this, uh, when Aristotle is considering the nature of friendship, he says, let's make a distinction based on the goods that the friendship is in terms of. Some friendships are genuine friendships in terms of the, the character of the people themselves. These are the closest, most paradigmatic kinds of friendships. But a lot of friendships are friendships of pleasure. We're, we're friends with people because we get pleasure out of it and we give pleasure to them. Some, it's not even pleasure, it's usefulness or benefit in, in some way. And you know, each of these is a distinct kind of friendship, well, that's making distinctions, right? Inquiries, explanations, and accounts. When we talk about inquiring, and it could be spelled with an E or an I, right? Uh, <clears throat> inquiring into something, seeking out the, the truth about something, trying to figure things out, that's what we're engaged in a lot of the time in philosophy. We're asking things like, well, what does Thomas Hobbes actually think? Is Thomas Hobbes actually right in what he thinks? What about what so-and-so has to say? What about our own experience? Is that confirmed, uh, does that confirm rather, or disconfirm what this, this person over here has to say? How does the world become richer or poorer as we're applying this mode of thinking, providing explanations for why things are the way they are or why they aren't the way that we think they should be, right? Or what's actually going on in a thinker's writings and the, the statements that they're making, all of these sorts of things. Accounts, being able to say, well, this is, this is what is, here's what's going on. When we feel a sense of remorse, having done something wrong. Is that a purely subjective feeling or does that reflect anything out there in the world that is pressing upon us? Well, that's something we could give a philosophical account of. We call those the moral emotions, right? And so that, that is what a lot of philosophizing is doing and, and accounts will incorporate doctrines, definitions, analogies, all these other sorts of things. Sometimes the emphasis is more on the activity of producing these. Sometimes the, the emphasis will be on the final product. You know, we can't talk with Immanuel Kant anymore. He's long dead, but we can read his books and see what he has to say. Likewise, you know, his contemporary Mary Wollstonecraft, we can, as I have my students do every semester when I teach her, we can say the things that she was making criticisms of in terms of culture, the distinctions between men and women and what they are able to do, 
Does that apply today, or does that have we gotten past that? When we bring these texts into the, pl- the present, we are bringing along inquiry, explanations, and accounts. Finally, another really, really key central aspect of philosophy, argumentation and arguments. Not exactly the same thing. Think of argumentation as broader. There's all these different strategies and ways of arranging things that we, we do in order to make our cases, in order to articulate what it is that we want to say with all of these other things. Sometimes we make quite explicit arguments. Sometimes we even label them as arguments. I should point out that the, the meaning of argument has become you know, more focused recently. Uh, it's got a broader sense throughout uh, history of philosophy so that an argu- might, argument might actually consist of a whole bunch of other arguments. Um, but it has a logical structure that we can represent and examine and weaken or strengthen. Arguments can be defeated. Arguments can be uh, strengthened and supported in other ways. These are very, there's a whole range of things that we do with arguments. And we do this whether we're talking about metaphysics or epistemology, these more theoretical disciplines, or whether we're talking about you know, trying to produce attitudes, actions, choices, priorities, policies in political philosophy, in aesthetics, in um, philosophy of sports, pick whatever it is that, that you want. And so the arguments, argumentation, another very important part of philosophy. All of these are things that you're going to see philosophers using, talking about, engaging in as you look at their writings and As you start doing some philosophy of your own, you will find yourself engaging in these as well.